For the past few years, I've been studying full time as a computer science student while also trying to balance creating YouTube videos, applying to internships and maintaining my mental and physical health. And while I finally figured out a decent system for managing my time, it didn't always used to be like that. When I was in high school, I'd procrastinate most of my work until the very last day. For multiple classes, my strategy was to literally not do anything until the night before the test and to just try to cram everything the day before. And yeah, this actually worked for a few of my high school classes, but as soon as I went to college, I realized that this deep procrastination just wouldn't fly anymore. It sounds obvious, but it took struggling through my first year to figure out that I simply shouldn't leave everything until the day before it's due. I needed a system for organizing my time and scheduling out when I'm going to get everything done. If you're new here, my name's Amon, and in this video, I'm going to break down six techniques that I use to manage my time as a computer science student. This way, you don't have to struggle through your first year to figure them out. You can just start using them from day one. Timestamps are in the description, so feel free to jump around. With that, let's begin. My first time management tip is the nine o'clock rule. It seems like every productivity YouTuber has a series of videos about the rules they live by, and this is my addition. The nine o'clock rule stems from the personal observation I've made that going to sleep on time is probably the single most important time management technique I've ever used. Let me explain. I've noticed that whenever I stay up late and lose sleep, my entire plan for the next day is completely ruined. I end up squandering the most productive hours of the day, which for me are between nine and 11 a.m. This is why on most days I try to follow the 9 o'clock rule. Basically, I don't schedule anything, I don't do any work, any chores, literally nothing after 9pm. At 9pm, unless it's a literal life or death situation or some sort of emergency deadline, I will stop working, I will stop doing whatever I'm doing and get up and get ready for bed. Now, I don't end up always following this, but I try to on most days. And when I do go to bed on time, I end up being so much happier and productive the very next day. I wake up on time, get eight hours of sleep, I have time to work out, I can actually stick to my schedule, all of which contribute to way better mental health. The biggest mistake people make when trying to improve their time management skills is staying up way too late, which inevitably ends up derailing their entire next day. You simply can't be productive if you end up staying up till 2, 3 in the morning unintentionally and end up waking up around noon and losing hours of prepared work time. Now, you don't have to follow the 9 o'clock rule. For you, it could be the 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock rule. What matters is that you're intentional about when you stop all activities for the day so you can build a consistent routine. One tip that really helps me with this is setting an alarm at 9 p.m. every night so I know exactly when my workday should end and I should start getting ready for bed. Honestly, I don't always follow this rule. There are times where I convince myself, hey, so-and-so invited me to a party or a hangout. I can just let loose and stay up till 10 or 10.30 p.m. And regardless if I do have fun in the moment, the next morning, I almost always regret it because I end up staying up too late, waking up late, and then squandering my plan. I don't think there's ever been a time in my life where I stayed up past 10 or 10.30 p.m. and I was genuinely happy about it the next day, at all. The timing has always been a net negative. And this is just my personal experience. You may be different. If you're someone who stays up until 2, 3 a.m. every night and has a great time and wakes up the next morning ready to tackle the day, awesome. Whatever works for you is best, of course. Maybe you should follow the 2 a.m. rule. What matters is that you're being intentional and you stick to those behaviors that bring you the most value. However, I have a suspicion that a lot of people end up staying up late because they have FOMO or fear of missing out. I definitely feel this from time to time, especially when I look at social media and it looks like everyone's having a great time at night and I missed out because I went to bed at 9.30 and woke up early to go to the gym. But going to bed on time doesn't mean you have to never socialize again. Here's how I think about it. You can get most of the benefit of social interaction by simply doing it early in the day and checking out early. Then you avoid the massive sleep hangover and cost to your productivity the next day. And for those of you who want to go to bed early but feel FOMO, you're not missing any super fun or meaningful moments. The truth is that people don't make meaningful connections and friendships at 3 in the morning. You're not really present in these moments. True friendships come from compounding interactions over time, overcoming adversity together, and also being there for someone in their time of need, not from partying all night. I'm going to make another disclaimer. If you're someone who really enjoys staying out late and gets a ton of value and happiness from it, don't stop. I'm just speaking from my own personal experience and my life is just so much better if I end up going to bed on time. My second time management tip is more of a mindset than an actual technique, but you need to understand this to get why the rest of the tips are useful. A while ago, I heard this quote from President Dwight D. Eisenhower, where he basically said, plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. At the time, I didn't really get it, but when I started to plan more consistently every day, I finally understood what he meant. The value of planning is that it forces you to take a step back and actually examine whether you're moving in the right direction. 
a lot of us waste so much time working hard for something and then later on realize we were moving in the completely wrong direction. For example, when I was in high school, I played the saxophone. Every year, I'd learn a ton of music that I didn't enjoy just to audition for a specific group. I'd move from competition to the next competition to the next competition, but I never took a step back and asked myself what was it all for? What is the point of garnering achievements or accolades in the first place? If I'd actually taken time to plan my saxophone career, I would have realized that I play the saxophone because I enjoy making music that I like. This seems obvious, but it would have completely changed my behavior. First of all, I would stop learning music that I didn't enjoy purely for competitive sake. Instead, I'd ask myself, what music do I like the most, and learn that. I would have probably focused more exclusively on jazz and only played songs that I enjoyed. For most of my life, I only dealt with things that were right in front of me. I would never actually step back and examine what I was doing from a distance. While plans sometimes fall apart, the act of planning forces you to ask yourself the hard questions and consider all the options. Am I even moving in the right direction? Is this the most efficient way to follow through on my goals? If you never plan, all you'll do is jump from deadline to deadline. There will never be a moment where you step back and actually analyze whether you're working on the right things. My third time management tip is the power of batching. Now that you understand the abstract value of planning, how should you actually schedule things out? I would suggest prioritizing batching, meaning you group similar tasks together, so you reduce the cost in time and attention from switching from task to task. The concept of batching is simple, but there are several reasons why it's so effective and several techniques to implement it. When you switch between different work items, your attention doesn't immediately follow as you might expect. There exists an attention residue, a small part of your thought process which is lingering and focusing on what you were just doing. This phenomenon is most present when looking at standardized testing. Often, teachers instruct you to skip a question and come back to it if you can't figure it out. If you do this, chances are the solution will inexplicably pop up in your head when you return. This occurs because a portion of your attention, your subconscious mind, is actively mulling over the problem without you even realizing it. This effect is more prevalent when switching between unfinished tasks. Because attention is the currency of productivity, not time, attention residue can have a massive effect on your output. Batching protects against this by grouping similar tasks together, thus reducing the attention deficit caused by switching between tasks and allowing you to get more work done. Batching is really useful when you set out to accomplish a specific task. Let's say you have a paper to write or some homework to complete. It's far better to finish it all out in one sitting rather than spreading it out throughout the week because there's a huge mental effort it takes to start at each discrete time. Batching has its limitations when you're studying for an exam or trying to remember something long term. If you have a final, it's obviously not good to batch all your studying in one sitting. You should probably spread that out over a few days which would help with long term memory. However, when your goal is to finish something or create something effectively, it's always better to do similar tasks one after another in one long session. This reduces context shifts. Let's consider batching and academic work. Instead of doing homework from each class every day, you should designate certain days of the week for specific classes. For example, if you have a large assignment for a math class due every Wednesday, you should just knock it all out in one long session on a Sunday afternoon. Don't do a little bit every day. It takes a lot of effort to get into the flow of problem solving, so don't waste it with one measly session. I also use batching for all of my household tasks, including cleaning and cooking. For example, every Sunday I will clean my entire apartment in one afternoon. Instead of cleaning one thing every day, it is much more effective to do it in one long sprint. I'm also working to adopt meal prepping into my routine, so I do all my cooking in one long session rather than multiple times every day. My fourth time management tip is to time block deep work sessions into your calendar. According to Cal Newport, deep work is professional activities performed in a state of distraction-free concentration that push your cognitive capabilities to their limit. Most of your important work should be done in a state of deep extended focus. If you look at influential thinkers from the present and past, almost all of them perform some kind of deep work. The problem with modern society, however, is that deep work is happening less and less because of fragmented attention. People are spending less and less time in focus while easily distracting themselves with social media, the internet, and email. The reason deep work is important is because often it's necessary to do difficult things. To complete difficult tasks, you need to be tightly focused on the problem in front of you. It's impossible to do this if you're checking your Instagram every five minutes. The truth is that no one actually intensely focuses for more than five to six hours per day. Most people actually drastically overestimate the amount of time they spend working. If you hear someone say they work for 10 to 12 hours per day, it's probably because a lot of that time is spent in shallow focus, talking to the people around them and engaging with social media. The key to maximizing productivity is to maximize the intensity of focus. It 
doesn't matter how many hours you spend studying per week. What matters is how many hours you spend intensely focusing in a state of deep work. This is why the question, how many hours do you study per week is so stupid. People who ask that question never consider intensity of focus, simply time, which is a completely flawed model. The goal is to spend as much time in deep work as possible. The way you do that is by time blocking deep work sessions into your calendar. So what is time blocking? Time blocking is the act of setting aside designated time for completing specific tasks. It's when you look at your calendar and create blocks of time to work on specific things. Here's how I time block deep work. According to research, the maximum time that people can focus without some sort of break is up to 90 minutes. Obviously, there are tons of people who can barely focus for 5 to 10 minutes before their mind starts wandering. However, you can build up your focus to the 90 minute marker if you work up to it and use techniques like leaving your phone outside, maintaining a clean workspace, and using a Pomodoro timer. When I don't have classes, I split my day up into three to four 90 minute deep work sessions. During each of those sessions, I will set a specific goal, something I want to specifically get done by the end of that session. Let's take a look at my schedule for a specific day in the summer when I was doing my software engineering internship. That day, I planned to wake up by six and get ready by seven. From seven to eight, I did some reading and some admin tasks to get my brain working. Finally, at 8 a.m., I began my first deep work session. My goal during that session was to convert a specific portion of my application to a new framework called Spring Native. I was exploring this topic for my intern project. During my deep work session, I always leave my phone outside my room and set a 90 minute timer. Afterwards, I will take a 20 to 30 minute break where I take a walk outside or do something that I enjoy. Later on, I had two more deep work sessions, both of which had a predetermined goal. It's important to think about what you're going to get done beforehand. This creates time pressure and creates directed attention towards getting a specific problem done, instead of dilly-dallying for an hour checking email. If I get my three deep work sessions done every day, I consider that a great day. Even though I technically only worked for five hours or so, the time was spent in intensely deep focus. You'll be surprised at how much you can get done if you actually focus for 90 minutes straight. Another tip related to time blocking is to use recurring events for important but not urgent tasks. A lot of activities like going to the gym, practicing singing, and reading are not actually urgent. Meaning there's no deadline, no one will put a gun to your head and force you to go to the gym the next morning. Which is why you need strong habits to always get these things done. I found the Eisenhower matrix really useful when considering this problem. It distinguishes between different kinds of tasks. Specifically for important but not urgent tasks, it suggests regularly scheduling those in with recurring events. For example, I have a two hour recurring event every other morning to go to the gym and work out. I also have recurring events for music practice and writing, things that are important towards my long-term goals, but no one will force me to get done. Finally, when time blocking, make sure to adjust how much time you allocate for each task based on how much time it actually takes you to do it. One issue with making schedules is that we often think in the best case scenario, meaning we only give ourselves the minimum necessary time to get something done. This plays into the Superman fallacy, the tendency to consider our future selves as Superman, someone who immediately gets out of bed in the morning, stays intensely focused all day, and never gets distracted. The problem with this tendency is that we're not Superman. So if you're too idealistic when planning, almost every day your plan will get completely derailed because it'll just take too much time to get everything done. In the past, I used to only give myself one hour to wake up, get ready, go to the gym, work out, and come back. And yeah, maybe if I was Superman, I could fly to the gym instantaneously, get my workout done, and quickly get back. But almost every day, what actually happens is this. It takes me about 30 minutes to work up the courage to get out of bed after I wake up at 6. Then it takes 20 minutes to get ready for the gym, fill up my water bottle, pack my bag. My workout itself often takes an hour and a half because I'm doing a full body workout with tons of exercises and up waiting in line for the bench and squat rack half the time. Overall, from waking up, going to the gym and coming back is a 2.5 hour long process. I need to plan for that when time blocking in my calendar. In all those days where you wake up as Superman and are able to get everything done much faster, you just earn some extra time at the end, which is always great. My fifth tip for time management is to keep a running to-do list. A to-do list is great for keeping track of everything you need to get done. When working, I'll often always remember a ton of small things I need to get done, like sending an email or taking out the trash. One technique would be to do these things immediately as soon as you realize them. The problem with this is that they'll interfere with your deep work sessions. You can't focus if you just randomly get up and start doing the dishes while you're working. It's so easy to get distracted while working by thinking about other important things you need to do. For example, the other day while I was studying, I noticed that tvOS 15.1 just came out. So I rushed to install it on my Apple TV and lost 20 minutes out of my deep work session. I should have just put it down on my to-do list and continued working. Another 
technique would be to store these tasks in your memory and just remember to do them later on. But as David Allen has always said, our minds are for having ideas, not holding them. Half the time someone tells me to do something and I will forget unless I write it down. To-do list is amazing because it allows you to offload your work into another system. It's really great to be able to just check my to-do list when looking for something to get done or scheduling the next day. I made a whole video about Todoist and to-do list, so you can check it out if you're interested. My last tip for time management, and this is a short one, is to implement some sort of evening review or reflection right before going to bed. Every night I have a brief evening review where I look at my calendar and reflect on what I got done and also plan the next day. I usually time block tomorrow during this time and look at my schedule. I often do this right after I'm done getting ready for bed, usually around 9.30 p.m. It's really important to make sure you have everything in order and plan for the next few days, so you can sleep peacefully knowing that everything will be taken care of. So in conclusion, here's a brief review of my time management techniques. First of all, I follow the 9 o'clock rule, which means I try my best to stop working at 9 and go to bed on time. Second, the act of planning is inherently valuable. It gives you a much better perspective on your work and goals. Next, when planning out tasks, make sure to batch as much as possible. For example, if you have a bunch of cleaning to do, it's better to batch it all in one long session than separate it out over the week. Fourth, time block in your calendar every single day. This is where you put in calendar events to schedule out your activities. This can be great for deep work sessions and recurring tasks. Fifth, use a to-do list. They're excellent at keeping track of homework, assignments, or really anything you need to get done. Finally, do some sort of evening review where you plan out the next day and reflect on your goal progress. If you're interested in learning more about my habits and routines, you can watch this video right here where I talk about how I rediscovered my love of reading and re-implemented reading into my life. Anyway, thank you guys for watching. A like would be incredible, and I will see you in the next video.